Okay, thank you very much, Alex, for inviting me to this very exciting workshop. And thank you for the 500 participants who are online watching this uh, very early morning talk. 490 now, I think one guy left. Um, okay, so today's topic is going to be, uh, for this talk, use of individual electric field models in clinical research. Uh, when I wrote this talk, I thought the title is vague enough that allows me to talk about whatever I want. So I'll be talking about a variety of uh, brain stimulation techniques and how electric field models are useful. Um, first of all, this question came up uh, several times yesterday of why we utilize these computational electric field models. And as far as I'm concerned, I use uh, computational models uh, for three things. One is to study the physics of brain stimulation and to benchmark technology to compare different stimulation techniques and paradigms. It's important that when you pick up a piece of tool that you know what you can do with it. And more importantly, not more important, but as important, uh, you, want, you want to know what you cannot do with it. You want to understand the physical limitations. You want to understand the trade-offs, for example, the depth locality trade-off with TMS. Um, and so this way it allows you to better utilize that piece of technology. The second reason for using electric field models is to study dosing. Uh, and to study target engagement uh, in your clinical or neuroscience studies uh, in understanding the dose response function and also inter-individual variability. It allows you uh, to, to come up with efficient protocols to normalize for inter-individual differences uh, and better uh, engage your target. And finally, uh, the one final reason to use these computational models is that once you gain enough insight into the physics of the technique and also those response relationships, it allows you to uh, come up with better technology for more efficient and more efficacious stimulation techniques. And for the rest of the talk, I'm going to give you a, a bunch of examples of uh, these applications of computational models. And I'll be talking about a variety of techniques and there are many brain stimulation techniques nowadays, which I have loosely categorized into this uh, picture here, based on their invasiveness profile and also uh, roughly their spatial resolution and focality of targeting. Uh, on the very far right, you have surgical techniques. These are invasive stimulation techniques, such as deep brain stimulation and vagus nerve stimulation. These techniques involve surgical implantation of electrodes and battery pop packs in the, the body to allow for chronic and focal stimulation of specific brain regions or uh, vagus nerve. A little bit less invasive, we have the convulsive therapies. Uh, these are electroconvulsive therapy and magnetic seizure therapy, which I will talk a little bit about in the second half of the talk. Uh, these involves application of magnetic fields and electric fields to induce a therapeutic seizure uh, in patients who are under generalized anesthesia. Less invasive, uh, we have the subconvulsive techniques, suprathreshold techniques, such as transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS. These techniques are strong enough to induce action potentials in the neurons underneath the coil, uh, but not strong enough that you induce a seizure. Uh, and then finally, we have subthreshold techniques. These include uh, transcranial direct current stimulation and other forms of electrical stimulation. Uh, also uh, in this category are your low field magnetic stimulation techniques using large coils or rotating magnets, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, for starting with TMS, I'm gonna jump around a little bit uh, with the different techniques. Starting with TMS, one of the questions that comes up all the time is, how do I target? Where do I put the coil on the head? The clinical standard for coil placement for treatment for depression, which is FDA approved, it's the so-called five centimeter rule. In this approach, you identify the motor hotspot that would induce a reliable thumb twitch, uh, either observed visibly or uh, more accurately using uh, measurements of motor evoked potential. In any case, you identify the motor hotspot 
and then you move to the coil anterior to that hot spot in this parasagittal plane along the scalp, five centimeters, arriving at what you might call the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and that is the site for treatment for depression. Now you can imagine that this technique is not very accurate uh, because it does not account for uh, size of people's head. Five centimeters is very different on different size heads. Um, so a slightly better approach, but still a scalp landmark based approach is the so-called beam F3 method uh, based on a EEG system placement. This way you measure head circumference and distance of nasion to anion and also tragus to tragus distance. You type in those measurements into a simple calculator and out pops the location of the F3 EEG location, which uh, is a, a approximate landmark also for what you might call the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. At least this method scales somewhat for uh, head size. A uh, slightly better, a better approach, more accurate approach involves uh, use of structural MRI. Uh, and this particular one came from the Mayo Clinic in a uh, depre depression study with adolescents, uh, identifying first a brain target for stimulation and then using a neural navigation tool to project that target to the surface of the head. And so one would like to compare uh, the electric field profile with these different strategies for coil localization. Uh, and this is a pilot study that was conducted at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, the PI was Paul Crokin, uh, and in which he recruited uh, a handful of adolescent depressed subjects who undergone depression treatment. It's an open label depression treatment using a standard protocol, 10 hertz RTMS delivered to the right to the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And so you can see here on the head models uh, that the dots, the yellow, blue, red, and green dots marking the location of the motor hotspot and also uh, theoretical locations for the five center, the, the location for the five centimeter rule, the beam F3 method, and also the MRI, structural MRI localization target. And so as you can see across uh, subjects, there is uh, incredible variability on where these targets ended up and also the distance between these targets uh, vary quite a bit. So what, when you quantify the electric field, something very interesting that you see here that the five centimeter rule consistently underdose the electric field to the, medi the middle frontal gyrus and also the uh, adjacent soci. The F3 method on average performs uh, quite similarly to the MRI guided targeting method, uh, but you can see from the individual maps here that some, for some subjects the F3 tar target is still quite far from the MRI target, which is taken as the sort of the gold standard in this particular study. Uh, so from electric field modeling, uh, we find that the clinical standard way of targeting TMS is perhaps suboptimal. There are more advanced techniques for targeting, uh, such as the use of fMRI, uh, exemplified by this uh, very nice paper from Alexander Sack back in 2009, showing that uh, using fMRI activation to identify the hotspot hot for uh, the TMS uh, greatly increases the statistical power uh, for you to find an effect. Uh, so in this curve showing that in order to achieve statistical significance uh, with the fMRI approach, perhaps you only need about five subjects or so in this uh, numerical Stroop task that they were piloting. Uh, with a scalp-based approach based on using an EEG coordinate, perhaps you need 40 to 50 people to demonstrate a reliable uh, statistical effect. Uh, there are other reasons for using uh, fMRI targeting. For example, in this uh, very nice paper, using resting, resting state functional connectivity uh, to identify subtypes of depression. So these are uh, was uh, done using a collection of over a thousand subjects who are depressed and using a machine learning algorithm to identify clusters 
of abnormal functional uh, connectivity patterns and also distinct symptom profiles and identified four uh, neurophysiological subtypes of depression. And one of these subtypes identified um, as characterized by uh, frontal amygdala and orbital cingulate network abnormalities and also with associated elevated anxiety and fatigue symptoms, the so-called biotype one, uh, it was shown to be responsive, preferentially more responsive to uh, repetitive TMS delivered to the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex. Um, so that might be a reason to use fMRI targeting. Uh, in, another, in another work by Michael Fox Group and MGH, showing that uh, the anti-correlation anti between the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the subgenual anterior cingulate is a very important marker for uh, treatment in predicting treatment response. Um, so in, in this kind of framework, you would identify the cortical region uh, near this patch of brain area that would show the highest anti-correlation with the subgenual anterior cingulate and outcomes the, uh, the fMRI target for the TMS treatment. Once you derive the fMRI hotspot, the question is, well, do you just put a coil on top of it? And if so, what orientation? Because when you rotate the, or the TMS coil, uh, you get different electric fields because of the local geometry of the cortex. And so you can see from this uh, simulation plot of various targets in the right um, prefrontal region that uh, some directions uh, you, get, you end up with more electric field in your region of interest. Uh, and so perhaps uh, there is a reason to use modeling tools to optimize this coil orientation. And there are some tools available today uh, in SimNibs. Uh, I know that uh, the Duke team has developed uh, some method. The Toronto group has developed similar methods for such work. Um, we want to talk about also how would you derive these fMRI hotspots and what kind of mask to use because depending on how you constrained the, the, the discovery of the hotspot, you can end up with a very different targets. So there are different strategies for uh, identify the mask for the, the hotspot hunting. Uh, there's the anatomical map using something like a free surfer output to identify a middle frontal gyrus region, uh, which is much larger. Or you can run a group of subjects and uh, calculate a, on average what the functional activation cluster uh, for, for a certain functional task is. Or you can go online to a meta-analytical database like Neurosynth and look up a mask for that particular functional task. Or you can do it in some kind of an unconstrained approach and say, my target is somewhere in the, in the right hemisphere. Um, this is what we call the, we have no idea what we're doing method. Uh, and if, using these different masks, you do end up with different uh, fMRI hotspots. Uh, so be, be concerned about what uh, methods you're using to identify fMRI hotspots before you do coil localization. So that's uh, the targeting aspect from uh, sort of using a focal figure, eight t figure of eight TMS coil. Uh, what if your coil is much larger and you are not concerned about targeting? What if your coil looks like this, like an MRI head coil? Uh, this is the so-called low field magnetic stimulation discovered uh, serendipitously at uh, McLean Hospital by Dr. Michael Rohan, who scanned a handful of bipolar subjects using a novel echoplanar imaging sequence. And these patients came out of the scanner reportedly feeling uh, some relief in symptom. And uh, Dr. Rohan said, hey, there must be something in this coil that is stimulating the brain in a, a weekly uh, so that you can achieve these, this antidepressant effect. And so uh, the technology was developed uh, and several clinical trial were conducted. These are the results from the Cornell trial. And you can see that as uh, after only about three sessions, you start to see some separation in 
measures of depression, the Hamilton score, the six item Hamilton score, and also the uh, visual analog scale for mood ratings start to separate between the active and the sham group. Um, so the question is, what brain regions is this large head coil stimulating? And for this, we turn to um, field modeling. And this is work uh, done at Duke, led by Bosho Wang, who, who is online, I think. Uh, we simulated this head coil, an MRI head coil, and uh, we plotted the electric field over the cortex. And it turns out the maximum stimulation is along the midline, sort of in this uh, highest stimulation occurs at this dorsal medial prefrontal cortex region with an electric field comparable to what you might get from transcranial direct current stimulation, sort of in this 0.5 volt per meter range. Um, he also did some optimization work um, using the desirable electric field produced by the large head coil and uh, running some optimization algorithm and come up with an alternative coil design that is more energy efficient that also produces a similar electric field on uh, in the brain so the very very interesting work that is used to uh, using electric field modeling techniques to optimize technology another piece of technology that, that's kind of similar uh, in this low field magnetic stimulation range are the so-called uh, synchronized TMS or another version of it is called transcranial rotating permanent magnet stimulation. Um, permanent magnets that are mounted on motors that are rotating at a certain frequency. And I'll show you two versions of it. One version involves smaller magnets and the other one slightly larger magnets. And uh, the NeoSync device is being used for treatment of depression. Um, so we would like to understand what kind of field strengths that we get from this uh, transcranial rotating magnet stimulation, and uh, we simulated it, yeah, the electric field. So in this particular one, a very small magnet was used. These are N52 grade neodymium magnets that are axially magnetized. The size is a, about three eighths of an inch long and a quarter inch in diameter with a surface magnetic field of 1.48 Tesla placed um, about uh, half a centimeter away from the head in the perpendicular position. Uh, these magnets are mounted on motors uh, that can spin uh, at 24,000 RPM or 400 Hertz. Um, the, the electric field was solved in COMSOL. Um, so a little bit about the, uh, the technique. So you draw your magnet and also there's a mesh it's a moving mesh so you need to draw an interface allow that allows the magnet to rotate um, the conductive parts of the motor the rotor is modeled using ampere's law and the non-conductive parts both the, the rotor and the stator are using a model using this uh, magnetic flux conservation equation for the uh, magnetic uh, magnetic scalar potential um, i'm going to skip Talking about meshing, the meshing and solving actually was quite tricky to do with this particular setup because it involves a moving mesh. Um, but anyway, uh, this is what it looks like uh, as the magnet is spinning. So you can see that as the magnet spins, a very interesting uh, field pattern spatially. It switches from what looks like a circular field pattern to something that looks like a figure of eight field pattern. Uh, so you get a figure of eight when the magnet is perpendicular to the head, and when the magnet is parallel to the head, you get sort of this uh, circular field pattern. Very interesting. Um, a similar approach, uh, also using uh, rotating magnets, um, was hypothesized by Andy Luchter from UCLA. Uh, in observing that uh, in depression, the cortical thalamic circuit generates alpha and theta synchronization. So this uh, similar approach also uses uh, permanent magnets. Uh, these are also cylindrical magnets, but uh, diametrically uh, magnetized. And these, there are three of them placed over the frontal pole region and also frontal and parietal regions. And uh, according to uh, Andy Luchter's theory, that by rotating these magnets at a uh, alpha frequency that's individualized, you can reset cortical oscillators 
in a similar fashion as uh, transcranial alternating current stimulation, perhaps. And so, uh, so, so as the magnet is rotating um, on top of the head, you alternate between this circular field pattern and to the previous uh, magnet setup, which is rotating uh, sort of uh, not up along the, oh, my internet is unstable. Uh, this is what it looks like with three magnets uh, over a more or less a realistic head model. And uh, you can see how the field pattern changes. But what's more important here is not exactly the shape of the field pattern, but also the magnitude of the electric field induced in the head. Uh, this is on the order of 0.06 volts per meter. So, uh, and, and then in the brain, further away from the scalp, the magnitude drops off to about 0.02 volt per meter in the brain, uh, roughly an order of magnitude lower compared to transcranial direct current stimulation. So the question is, is it doing anything? Um, is this kind of field strength, what kind of biological effect can this field strength strength have. So uh, there's a couple of groups out there running rodent studies using this approach of low intensity repetitive magnetic stimulation using a miniaturized uh, coil uh, to stimulate in the rodent model and uh, ran some field simulations of what that looks like. And uh, it produces roughly um, similar electric field to uh, the, the rotating magnet case. Uh, maybe a little bit stronger. And so we ran some experiments and we said with this electric field strength, uh, is it doing anything in the brain? So in this particular experiment in collaboration with uh, Rachel Sherrod's group from in France, we did some in vivo and also uh, stimulation on a dish. Um, so in this particular setup, we surgically removed the innervation between the inferior olive and the cerebellum. And so you can see here, but only on the one hemisphere. So we only removed it on the left hemisphere and on the right hemisphere, we left those axons intact. And so you can see here that these climbing white fibers uh, that are the white stripes showing up on the molecular layer of the brain. Um, and then on the left side, these innervations are removed. And during, and for, after sham stimulation using a uh, biomimetic high frequency stimulation protocol, nothing happens. Uh, you don't see any structural regrowth of the axon. But after two weeks of active stimulation using this high frequency stimulation, you see that the axons just start to grow back. So uh, even at very low intensities, we're showing that uh, magnetic stimulation can have effects on neuroplasticity. Uh, we also stain cells to, you can see that with this high frequency stimulation, it almost doubled the number of CFOS positive cells, which is uh, an indirect measure for neuronal activity. So, and one follow-up experiment is also very interesting. This is a double knockout experiment, knocking out the CRYP1, CRYP2 genes. Um, in the wild type, you see this activation of cellular activity. Uh, after you knock out those pair of genes, it completely abolishes the uh, response to magnetic stimulation. It's not that we're knocking out the, the mechanism for regenerating axons, because once you apply BDNF to the same sample, you start to see the axons uh, activate, the cells activate again. So this pair of genes seems to be quite specific to the magnetic stimulation effects. Um, whether this translates to humans, that's still um, an open question, but at least the point is that we're seeing, even at very low intensities of magnetic stimulation, there are all kinds of biological effects with neuroplasticity changes, gene expression changes, as well as direct cellular activation changes. Changing a little bit in the intensity, we would like to end this talk by talking about electroconvulsive therapy, which uses um, not one milliamps, not two milliamps, but 800 milliamps to try to induce a therapeutic seizure in the brain. 
uh, an ECT uh, stimulator delivers a sequence of electrical pulses through scalp electrodes to induce an electric field and current flow in the brain. This, when massive populations of neurons are then firing in synchrony, it produces a generalized tonic clonic seizure, um, which alters brain chemistry and brain activity, which ultimately manifests in clinical outcome. ECT is still the, one of the most effective, um, efficacious treatment for uh, refractory depression, catatonia, and rapid relief for suicidal ideation. And we want like to look at uh, the different parameters in controlling this ECT stimulus. Uh, starting with current amplitude control. This is an actual ECT machine that was used at Duke. And you can see from the front panel that there are different knobs for controlling various aspects of the stimulus, including pulse width, frequency, and duration of the stimulus train. But when it comes to current amplitude, that knob has been removed. Indeed, this is how ECT practiced, is practiced clinically. You titrate the ECT stimulus by increasing the number of pulses by either lengthening the stimulus train or increasing the stimulation frequency until you elicit a therapeutic seizure. Meanwhile, within each one of these trains, the amplitude of the pulses are fixed at either 800 milliamps or 900 milliamps, depending on which of the two commercially available devices that you own. And we showed in previous modeling work that at 800 milliamps, you're pretty much stimulating all of the brain at a very high intensity, regardless of your electro placement. There's no concept of selective targeting with this 800 milliamp stimulation. And so another problem with using a fixed current amplitude, uh, as we saw yesterday in the TTCS talk, we end up with uh, incredible variability in the intracranial electric field. So these are simulations of actual ECT patients receiving right unilateral ECT. Same electrode placement, but, but sheer differences from sheer differences in anatomical variability and head geometry and tissue thicknesses and so on, you end up with wildly uh, different patterns of stimulation and different strengths of stimulation in the brain. And this is leading to a lot of uh, clinical variability as well. So one way to address that, um, we do this in TMS, we do this in DBS, is to titrate by amplitude. So perhaps start with a train that is of lower amplitude and slowly increase that until um, you, you uh, induce a seizure. And not only would this technique minimize the overexposure of the brain to uh, this very high stimulation level that's causing side effects, it also somewhat compensates for uh, inter-individual variability. And this technique was piloted in non-human primate. This was done by Dr. Angle Petercheff at Duke, um, showing here that across these uh, non-human primate subjects, the coefficient of variation in terms of stimulated brain volume decreases with this individualized uh, current amplitude titration technique compared to the fixed current, uh, high current, meaning that at least on a physical level, we're achieving more consistent results. And so this is uh, one uh, change of the paradigm we're bringing to ECT in humans. Another aspect that we're uh, changing and how field modeling can help is uh, inform where to place electrodes on the brain. ECT electrode placement uh, as done today is very much the same as how it was in the 1930s. Namely, they use very large electrodes that are spaced really wide across the head, producing, stimulating a, a, the whole brain uh, in between. And so uh, many years ago, we started to do electric field models in uh, human subjects. And today we, we actually ran some uh, electric field models in actual ECT patients, uh, showing here as a pilot study, uh, data from University of New Mexico with Chris Abbott, showing that the electric field induced in bilateral hippocampi are correlated with changes in hippocampal volume before and after ECT. This was was done initially in a pilot of 15 subjects. This work has since replicated in a much larger sample using the global ECT MRI research collaboration, which consists of uh, 
couple hundred ECT subjects across many different sites around the world. And in this particular analysis, using 151 patients who received right, received right unilateral ECT, we also see that the um, electric field is correlated uh, with volumetric changes of the hippocampus and also in the amygdala, um, which is quite interesting because for the first time, this is showing that the electric field is uh, related to physiological changes in the brain. And so once you find that, and, and that result can inform a target for further treatment, um, there's been some proposal to use multi-electrodes to uh, flexibly target and selectively target the different brain regions. And many algorithms have worked out. There's one built into SIMNIPS, which uh, you, you probably have seen in the work, in, in the uh, tutorial. Uh, you start by identifying a cortical target and some constraints on safety and focality, and then you solve an optimization algorithm for the ideal current injection pattern that would produce an electric field that fits uh, your pre-specified target. So this at least has worked out uh, in software, and of course, uh, the great quote by the American computer scientist, Alan Kay, people who are really serious about software should make their own hardware because we don't have an ECT machine that can support multi-channel stimulation. And so this is what we uh, set out to do here at the NIH uh, with uh, some engineers who are working with me in designing a multi-channel ECT system that can uh, perform this multi-channel multi-electro stimulation. So we started uh, designing and manufacturing the device, uh, both the, the electro cap and also the uh, stimulator parts. And so the next generation of ECT in summary uh, will be individualized, both using an individualized current titration method and also individualized using these electric field models derived from patient MRI. It will be targeted using a multi electro grid system instead of two very large electrodes that provide whole brain stimulation. Uh, and we also set out to uh, do better recording and understanding the propagation of the seizure better by incorporating high density uh, EEG recording while the seizure is happening so that we can source localize and reconstruct the seizure propagation pattern. And we're actively designing hardware to support um, uh, this next generation seizure therapy. So in summary, uh, I hope that I've given you uh, several examples of how electric field models are useful in clinical research, uh, all the way from techniques like electroconvulsive therapy to uh, some of these sub-threshold stimulation techniques with rotating magnets and, uh, and, and low field magnetic stimulation. Uh, with that, I will end my talk and take some questions. Thank you, Ji, and uh, good morning to everyone. I would like to remind that uh, anyone can ask questions through the course of the talk or right now during the Q&A by typing them in a group chat. And first question we have regarding the targeting of TMS and cost-benefits ratio. So the question is, uh, do you um, assume that anyone would need to do fMRI on every subject prior uh, running TMS study? Um, well, it's a, it's, it goes back to the SACS study showing that uh, with fMRI activation to identify a hotspot, uh, perchance you require less subjects because you have now better information about how uh, about brain function. And so it increases your statistical power in that way. If you were to do uh, a dumb scalp landmark targeting approach, uh, you might end up requiring 10 times more the sample size in order to demonstrate a, uh, an, a statistically significant effect. So there are trade-offs. It's more ex expensive to do fMRI. Uh, there are methodological issues that you have to work out, um, but you gain in better understanding of the mechanism of the stimulation and also in power. 
Thank you. <clears throat> and the second question regarding the multi-channel ECT work, uh, does it still uh, require seizures to work, clinically speaking? Does mm -hmm. it still? So, so very interesting question of uh, whether the seizure is really necessary in ECT. We're running a, another parallel study here at the NIH uh, led by Bill Ragnold uh, from Maryland. Uh, we're testing whether or not you really need to induce a seizure. Maybe you only need the electrical stimulation. Um, and and what, whether this electrical stimulation is interacting also with the, the anesthesia, um, that's another question that we're going to look at as well. Um, so the, the question is still open, um, and, and we have clinical studies uh, investigating that.